Welcome. This is Simply the Truth with me, Doug Harris. Thank you for joining us each week. We obviously want to take a subject and we want to deal with that subject as simply as we can. The truth coming out as simply as possible. And this week, we've got a subject that's very close to my heart, something I've really loved looking into over the years, and it's the whole area of apologetics. Okay, now don't get worried if you don't understand what that word means. Uh, my expert guest is going to tell you everything you need to know and more so that you understand it, uh, aren't you, Cecil? I'll do my best. <laughs> Cecil Andrews is from the uh, Apologetic Take Heed Ministries in Northern Ireland. He's taken part in two debates in Roman Catholicism over the past months. Uh, and, and, and you've worked some 22 years now with uh, Take Heed Ministries, um, uh, developing it. Uh, it's, it's an apologetic, it's a warning ministry, something that obviously is very uh, close to your heart. And we're going to look at a number of different issues that concern you uh, as we go through uh, this program. Fairly varied, but they've all got a theme. You, you feel that there are areas here that we need to be aware of as Christians and maybe have a warning about and certainly understand uh, as we go through. But let's start a little bit with you. Uh, I've had you on, uh, as I say, twice on uh, uh, Catholic debates, but we've never really uh, heard about you, the man. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your upbringing, coming to Christ, etc. Well, Doug, nice to be with you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, like many of the baby boomer generation in Northern Ireland, I was privileged to be raised in a Christian home, and my parents saw to that, that I was brought to church. And in my teenage years, I attended pre-communion classes for about six weeks. At the end of that time, I obviously gave the right answers to a set of questions, and that was perceived to be a credible profession of faith. And on the basis of that, I was allowed to uh, partake of the communion service. My heart wasn't changed. I had a head knowledge of things, but I was still the same sinful Cecil Andrews that I'd been born. In my early 20s, I drifted away from church. I was, if I might say it, not too bad at hockey and cricket. <laughs> and uh, my, my weekends were taken up mostly with sport and the associated social life that went with it. And for 18 years, I really had nothing to do with church. But in 1984, uh, things changed in the providence of God whilst on holiday. I went into a bookstore and I bought a few interesting books with interesting titles on religious themes. And uh, then I, I bought another book and it was called The Promise. And by the time I got back from that holiday, things were beginning to stir within me from all the childhood experience and exposure I'd had of going to church. And I was beginning to see myself in a new light, Doug. And that was I was beginning to see myself from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. And what I saw, I didn't like. The book called The Promise was very helpful because what it did was it showed how the Lord Jesus Christ had fulfilled many of the types and shadows that were found in the Old Testament, something I had never been exposed to before. Anyhow, to Shorten the story, on the 19th of August, 1984, I tell people I was of all men most miserable in Northern <laughs> Ireland. I really was burdened down by the reality I was only a breath away from a lost eternity. I wasn't attending church at, at that time, so I decided I wanted to hear the gospel, straight talking, straight preaching. And there was a well-known preacher who was also a politician in Northern Ireland, and I thought, I'm going to go and hear this man because he'll shoot from the hip. He won't waffle. And during that service, I can't remember what he said, but God certainly did a dealing with me. And he revealed to me not only the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross for sinners, but also the substitutionary life of Christ. He was the sinless one. He obeyed the law perfectly, mm -hmm. something that no person can do. And the great transaction was that my guilt and sin was laid on him, and through believing in him, I was clothed in his perfect righteousness. It was as if God dropped a robe of righteousness over me, and I was accepted in Christ. And I was born again that right. night. 
And your life obviously changed uh, from that point on. However you describe it, and some people may not understand the words you've, you've used there, a tremendous change took place. You knew at one point you were, you were lost, you were out there, you didn't know what was going on, and then another, you had been found, and, 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 and that which was wrong with you had been dealt with. Um, totally. Totally. Uh, it, it talks about uh, God will blot out our sins. And if you think of blotting paper, those of us who went to school and you used <laughs> nibs and ink, you had to use blotting paper to soak it up. Well, Christ on the cross soaked up my mm. sins into mm. his own body on the tree, mm. and I am no longer under the condemnation that they warrant. Absolutely. Great. That, that, that's how you came to know Christ. And that's, of course, is the beginning in all our lives. There, there's a beginning and there's a progression. And, and one day, well, you talk about the end, but you're not quite sure where the end of eternity is. But yes. there will be an end to this life and we'll move on to be with him. But while, while we're here on this earth, as after we've given our lives to Christ and Christ has touched us, um, we seek to serve him, and of course he calls us all in, in a different way and does different things with us. You've got this apologetic ministry, uh, Take Heed Ministries. Tell us how that came about, but also while you're doing that, explain what apologetics is. What, why have you got this warning ministry, this apologetic ministry, and how did it all come about? Shortly after I was converted in 1984, I changed job and I went to work in Belfast and I moved house as a result of that. And I went to live in an area of Belfast uh, called Carry Duff. And in 1985, when I moved there, living straight across the road from me was a man called Jim McCormick, who for many years in Northern Ireland had had an apologetics ministry, which was basically a warning ministry, alerting people to false teachings when they're compared to the scripture. And he and I became friends and I would have gone along with Jim to meetings. So that was 1985. 1986, I was single, had money, went on a holiday to the Holy Land. Do those, do those three things always go together? <laughs> well, when you're married, you don't. All right, carry on. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> but in 1986, went to the Holy Land, and a, a single nurse from Northern Ireland, uh, she and I shared a few ice creams beside the Sea of Galilee. And uh, three months later, we were engaged. Uh, I tell people I had to take the scenic route to meet a girl who lived about six miles from where I lived. <laughs> We were married in 1987. In 1988, Jim McCormick saw a new building opened to house his ministry because he had been working from home prior to that. And then sadly, the following year, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor and died a few months later. So this, my dear friend, who had introduced me to the whole concept of apologetics, was suddenly in glory. Uh, the managing director of the company that I was working for in Belfast was a Christian. And one day he called me into his office and said, Cecil, have you ever thought of serving the Lord full time? Well, I said, we've been praying about it for two years, but when you work for a building society as I did, the perks were good, cheap mortgage, company car, good salary. But he said, I'm not sacking you, your job's there. But if you like, I'll speak to the board and see would they give you a package to enable you to leave to serve the Lord. So they did. I couldn't retire on it by any means, but it was a stepping stone. And I left that job on the 31st of October, 1989. I waited on the Lord for a number of months. And the following September, I formed Take Heed Ministries mm -hmm. to really carry on the type of work that Jim McCormick had been doing. It's based on Matthew 24, verse 4, where the Lord says, Take heed that no man deceive you. That's going to be the defining mark prior to his return. Mm -hmm. And the trustees of the late Jim McCormick's ministry, they asked me, could I devote some of my time to keeping his ministry going? And then I spent the rest of the time developing Take Heed. And that was the situation up till 1999. And then Take Heed had grown so much I couldn't handle both. So we parted company amicably and I now work full time for Take Heed from home. I, I mean obviously uh, for, for me too I mean with Reach Out Trust that's that that's been my background and, and one of the things uh, and you just brought it back to me when you, you talked about Matthew 24 4 about deception and no man deceives you. 
when people come to us, I'm sure they do, and, and, and they say to you, Cecil, who, what gives you the right to tell us that this is deception? You know, it, it, you might yourself be deceived. So what gives you the right to tell us what's right and what's wrong? How do you answer that? Well, I, I tell them that there are many scriptures that actually command believers to exercise discernment. First uh, John 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, Matthew 7, the Lord warned of false prophets who would come in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they're ravening wolves. That means they're not saved, because a wolf is not a sheep. And he also says, by their fruits, you maybe we'll know them. No, he says, you shall know them. So if we know the scriptures, we should be able to identify those who are teaching something that is contrary to the scripture. And as I say, not just myself and yourself, but every believer should exercise discernment. And, and that, that has to be the basis, doesn't it? In other words, what I think, what I feel, whether I like something or don't like something. And, and some of us like one form of worship and some of us don't like it, but that doesn't make it right nor wrong. Uh, it has to be where we, what the scripture is clearly saying about it. And we have to make that presentation, don't we? Very much so. As I say, the only sure rule that we have is the word of God. That is what we test everything by because it's inspired, inerrant, and infallible. Mm. And human reasoning, sadly, are the opposite in so many cases. <laughs> and most of us, it doesn't add up anyway. <laughs> okay, um, what, one of the, 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 the sort of the groupings, and, and there can be different groupings that you are warning about, but one of the groupings goes under the name cults. Now, um, again, cults is something which can be used as something nasty, something horrible. And, and most people, if you say you're a cult, will feel, you know, how dare you call, call me that. Um, how do you define a cult? Well, a cult, according to the dictionary, is a system of religious worship and a sect is a religious denomination. So if you put those two things together, in many ways you could say that Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists are, are cults and so on. But obviously what we are thinking of are groups that uh, hold to beliefs which are contrary to the orthodox Christian beliefs of the traditional churches. Yeah. Uh, I tell people there are usually four features that you will find in what we de define as a cult. Firstly, they will have an earthly head or founder. Secondly, they will have an authority which is in addition to or in place of the Bible. Thirdly, they will have a wrong view of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And fourthly, they will have a wrong view of salvation. They're a bit like links in a chain. Along comes a founder who says, I have had this extra revelation apart from the Bible. And usually what happens is you end up with a deficient or wrong view of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that happens, then you end up with a wrong view of salvation. So those are, are the four features, and you could apply those to uh, some of the, the well-known groups that are defined as cults. Uh, Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I mean, where Mormonism is concerned, obviously, with the presidential election in America this year, there were views expressed from certain sources which have shocked many evangelical Christians. You've had leading figures declaring uh, Mitt Romney to be a Christian. But as I understand it, Mr. Romney is a faithful Mormon, and therefore, for me, he's a member of a group that would be defined as a cult. Mm. I, I come back to, just let me say, in case people misunderstood what you said a few minutes ago, when you said that Baptist methods, etc., <laughs> can be a cult, what you were saying is actually, if you take the dictionary definition as you said it, any Christian group is a cult, so that's just... <laughs> oh, yes. yeah. Otherwise, we're going to start getting letters and people are going to switch off because they missed what you said. But as you say, what we are saying is, OK, um, yeah, it's, it's a form of worship, but what we are saying is these groups 
pick up a form of worship mm -hmm. that is different to, that is, uh, that is other than the central belief system of, uh, of, of, of evangelical Christianity. And it, it's interesting because um, we've done a number of programs or did a number of programs uh, at the time on Mormonism and on, 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 on Mitt Romney. And you see, w one of the things that I found, and I I'm sure you find this, is you don't have to go to their enemies to, <laughs> to see what they're talking about. They themselves will quite clear. And quite clearly, they claimed, uh, their 15th president, um, uh, Gordon Hinckley, uh, claimed that they were the only true, the only true church on the whole face of the earth. Now, once you start saying that, you are claiming something of yourself that means everybody else is wrong. Yes, and he actually stated publicly that the Jesus that he worshipped was mm. different from the Jesus of evangelical Christianity. Right. He was quite upfront in admitting yes. that and so on. So, yeah, what, what uh, has intrigued me, of course, is that a lot of these groups, when they first founded, they did claim we're right, everybody else is wrong. And, and certainly Hinckley maintained that. But in recent years, they have mellowed to yes. a degree. They're seeking to be much more ecumenical. You, you even find Jehovah's Witnesses who in the times past would never have tried to describe themselves as Christians are now trying yes. to describe yes. themselves as Christians. But of course, when you uh, examine what they believe and what the scriptures teach, they cannot possibly be described mm -hmm. uh, as Christians. And I, I think I found that very, very helpful. So let's underline those four points you, you, you mentioned again. First of all, an earthly head. Uh, secondly, that they would have um, a, a, a book, a holy book, a scripture, if you like, in addition mm -hmm. to, to the Bible, uh, or they would change the Bible. They, they might have a book that's called the Bible, but they would change it. Um, they would have a wrong understanding of Jesus and then a, a, a wrong understanding of salvation. Now, we are not saying by that, we've mentioned Mormons, we've mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, I know we have Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses watching this program, um, and we have, I, I have a great relationship with them. And as I often say, when we say things like that, we are not saying you're nasty, horrible people. What we're saying is that these things are true of you. There is a different Jesus to the Jesus of Christianity, uh, evangelical central Christianity. There is a different way of salvation. Uh, and th that is the essence of it. And, and so let's not beat about the bush. That therefore makes you different to us. Yep. Uh, well, one of the problems, of course, is these groups and others very often use biblical language terminology that you and I would be familiar with. The problem is they have a, a different dictionary when it comes to defining the terms. We ourselves stick solely to the scripture, uh, but uh, for the uh, Jehovah's Witness, it might be reasoning from the scriptures, or for the Mormon, it could be the, the Book of Mormon or Doctrine and Covenants, whatever it happens to be. So as I say, uh, and, and this is where many within the professing Christian church, Orthodox Christian church, who are not really very discerning, sometimes get confused mm. because they hear language on their doorstep and they think, all oh, these people believe the same things as us, not realizing that these people actually define the terms totally different. And in, in the end, I, I mean, we have two things. Obviously, we have the doctrine which we believe now, which is important because that's going to affect our lifestyle. It's going to affect what we do. It's going to affect how, how we look upon Jesus, whether the work is finished and completed or whether we still got to work at it and, and things like that. But it's also where it leads to. And, and it, these, the, 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 the belief system of these groups has to lead in the end to a place where I am going to be at rest with my Saviour in eternity. And if it doesn't, we've got to say, well, hang on a minute, guys. You are presenting something which is wrong here. You are presenting something which is twisted here because I'm not going to end up where you tell me, you, you, where, where God wants me to end up to be with him in eternity. Well, th this is the worrying thing because th these people uh, could show orthodox professing Christians 
uh, how to be zealous Absolutely. for what they believe. Absolutely. Because, but then, of course, we, we realize that very often these people are so zealous because they're actually taught that their salvation depends on how hard they work. Because at, at the end of the day, there, there are really only two religions in the world. You're either saved by the grace of God, in other words, by the work that he does, not what you do, or else you're saved by your own works. And uh, that's the two types of religions. That, and very often these religious groupings that we identify as cults, they are telling their people, you have to work hard in order to obtain your salvation. Whereas you and I should be working hard because we have been saved. Mm. How, how do we act towards those people? Okay, we, we've co we come to the stage, as we have done to, to, the, you know, to, today, not nastily, but we have said Jehovah's Witness doctrine is different to ours. Mormon doctrine is different to ours. Therefore, by very definition, there's a different Jesus. There's a, there's a different salvation. That, that's there. Having defined that, does that mean I should hate this person and, you know, and absolutely cut myself off? How should I then act to that person? Well, I think we have to remember that there but for the grace of God go any of us. Uh, God has been gracious to us to reveal to us the truth and to save us. Uh, we must be, have full sympathy for the position that these people are in, and we must seek as graciously as we can to engage with them, to discuss the issues, uh, and to set before them the truth. At the end of the day, we are simply farmers scattering the seed of truth, and we can't talk anybody into the truth. We can only scatter the seed of truth and pray that God will bring that to life. And uh, that is what we are to do. And we are to be Christ-like. Uh, and Christ himself uh, was patient uh, with people uh, at times. And he witnessed to them about the truth. And uh, we must follow his example. Because uh, we're not saying, hey, guys, we're right you're wrong, and let's leave it there. We, apologetics, part of apologetics, isn't it, is presenting what we believe in such a way that gives them an opportunity to decide for themselves. Uh, is what you and I are saying about witnesses, about Mormons, is it true? Do they have a different Jesus? Do they have a different gospel? If so, Here's what we believe is the true gospel, the, the, the true Jesus. Consider it. That, that must be, and there has to be that relationship with them in, in, in order for that to happen, doesn't there? Absolutely. Uh, we, we don't want to get into a slanging match. Uh, we certainly don't want to use what I would call the baseball treatment, which happened some years ago in Limavady in Northern Ireland, where Mormons came to the door and some man chased them with a baseball. Uh, I do not approve of that in any shape or form at all. No, we are to witness uh, using the Word of God, uh, which is the only weapon that we have, and uh, we are simply to sow the seeds of truth. Yeah. I, I tell you what, uh, what came to my mind there, what wasn't somebody being chased by a baseball bat, but I don't know if you've seen the clip of Mitt Romney, uh, he, he's back uh, a, a few months ago in, in a mall in America, going shaking hands with people, and he went to shake hands with this guy that probably, well, he looked at least 70 or 80 years old. And, and you know, and, and Mitt Romney says, you know, will you shake my hands? Well, I'm not shaking hands with a Mormon, you know. Um, and th that to me is a nonsense, isn't it? Because in actual fact, if, if we feel they're wrong, one of the things we want to do is to have the opportunity to show them what's right. We, we don't just want to cut them off. And so we, we do want to reach a hand of friendship. And yes, no ulterior motive because we're totally open about it. So it's not, you know, we're going to bring in, but we do want to share. We do want to communicate. One of the dearest Christian friends I had was a former Carmelite priest called Bart Brewer who for years worked as a Roman Catholic priest. He, he wrote his testimony in a book called Pilgrimage from Rome. I spent time with Bart and he said that he, during all the time that he was a priest, no evangelical Christian came up to him and engaged with him and sought to witness the truth to him. And after 
Bart was converted. He vowed he would never let that happen. And I never saw anyone as gracious as Bart. He had tracts with him and he could spot priests out of uniform <laughs> just by the way their mannerisms and so on. And he had a very engaging way with them. And we saw him present tracts mm -hmm. uh, to people because he said, I'm not going to uh, let happen to those people what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the attitude. As the Lord provides us opportunities, we should graciously witness to these mm -hmm. people. Now, saying that, you'll maybe find that they don't really react terribly nicely, but that's to be expected. Yeah. And at the end of the day, as Paul said to the Galatians, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And we are not seeking to be enemies, we're seeking to be witnesses for mm -hmm. Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, 1, 1 Peter 3.15, which is a verse um, that I've certainly taken on board uh, over the years, apart from anything else, talks about always being ready. Yeah. And always being ready to give an answer to, to those that, 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 that ask. Do you think, I mean, you've been in this business 22 years, uh, and, and certainly I've looked over the last 30 odd years and see the same. Do, do, do you agree with me? Do you think that Christians are less and less bothered about being ready? In, in other words, I can understand somebody saying, I, I don't know how to talk to a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon on the doorstep. Fine. If that's the first time it's happened, great. My, my question then is, well, why don't you do something about it? But it seems to me that Again, you, 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 you can't sort of put the whole Christian church <laughs> under one label. But it seems to me there are a number of churches and a number of individual Christians, maybe many, maybe the majority, I don't know, that really are just not bothered about getting ready. Do, do you sense that's happening today? I think one of the major problems, Doug, is that we have a professing Christian church that is populated with many people who profess to being Christians, but I sometimes wonder, are they? I, I think we, over the last decades, there has become uh, a very easy believism Christianity. And I sometimes think that people have been told, you simply pray a prayer, that's you now a Christian. And I don't think it works just as easily as that. And I believe if someone has been truly converted as I myself was, knowing what has been removed from you, the wrath of God, being so grateful to Christ for the work that he did, you want to go out and serve him and to proclaim the truth about him. So I, I do think that many churches sadly have many people in the pews who have maybe been misled on the whole question of salvation. And then we have churches where the main focus seems to be more on nearly entertaining people rather than engaging with the lost world outside the four walls of the church building. Also today, people aren't into studying at length. Uh, if they don't get something in a few minutes with a sound bite, they don't really want to know. Unfortunately, it's the, the age and the generation that we're living in. And you, if you want to be a, an apologist, for the truth of the gospel, you're going to have to study what the scriptures teach. Mm -hmm. And that takes time and that takes uh, energy. And I think we, a lot of people don't want to give that time and energy today. I, I, I have to say, I'm sometimes amazed at you know, times when I go and take seminars and you know, for, for people that you, you would, and, and who profess that they've been in the church for five years, 10 years, mm -hmm. w w whatever it is. And, um, and yet, you know, when you can't start talking about some of the simple, simple things that you can do to communicate with people, it blows them away. Uh, is it because of this? Is it because maybe that in some cases the ministers are not prepared to do it? Maybe they don't find, think this is going to be crowd pulling if they say we're going to teach you how to witness and get out on the streets. I, I don't know. But surely we've got to come full circle within the church. We've, we've got to get to that stage which you have talked about there. Because, I mean, the scripture talks about, you know, tickling ears and that. Surely we've got to say to me, I don't just want my ears tickled. I, don't, I just don't want that to go on. I want to know and understand and so that I can communicate. I think one of the problems is that 
sin has lost its impact. The focus in many churches really isn't on sin. Mm -hmm. I think we live in this age where they have the user-friendly, seeker-sensitive type churches, which boast great numbers. But the last thing they ever want to talk about is sin because they feel that will be offensive to people. So in many ways, they have presented a Jesus who's not dealing with the sin issue, but rather he's dealing with the felt needs of people. You know, I, I have a problem in my marriage and we need to get this sorted out, or I have an addiction to this or to that, and we need to get that sorted out. Now, those things are very often the fruit of sin, but they're not the root problem, which is sin itself. And I feel the emphasis is wrong. And therefore, if people themselves hadn't haven't had the boil of sin lanced in their own life. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have a desire to go out and seek to reach others who mm -hmm. have the same problem. Absolutely. Uh, if you just joined us, I am talking to uh, Sister Andrews of Take Heed Ministries, and we're looking at the whole area of apologetics, of reaching out to people and communicating truth to them. I mean, what, what you've started talking about there, of course, I think is one of the areas that, that, that you are particularly concerned about today. And uh, you, you talk about seeker-friendly churches, which is something that's used sometimes a, a phrase like emerging church is put over it. But I think we have to be careful sometimes with phrases because some people put that phrase on churches which, which are fine. But what we're looking at, isn't it, is, is churches that are concerned more with numbers, concerned more with um, the, the, the ascetics of it rather than the hard preaching of the gospel. Are, are, are we, you know, by that, as you say, you get churches with massive numbers, mm -hmm. but are we weakening Christianity? Are we becoming an impotent church as the result of that? Well, very much so, because a lot of these churches, they have a sort of veneer of Christianity. They throw in a few Christian phrases and so on, but many of them are really just motivational talks. Mm -hmm. It's not sermons. It's not somebody expounding the Word of God. Uh, and then one of the largest uh, user-friendly, seeker-sensitive churches has been around for many years. They actually conducted an internal survey a couple of years ago of all the members, maybe 20 or 30,000, who had professed to become Christian over recent years. And they sought to determine how much they had grown spiritually. And they actually published the results mm, and they yes. discovered that not one of their members had grown spiritually at all. Mm. So what did they then do? They organized a conference and they brought in one of the leading emerging church gurus yes. who rejects many of the cardinal truths of scripture. Mm. So it was kind of out of the frying pan into the fire. And again, they're, they're dealing at everything on a human social level. They're not looking upward and seeing how people stand in the light of a holy God. Mm. And it comes down to the sin issue. They don't want to mention sin because mm. they feel that will put people off. Yeah, and th they seem to miss out so much of the New Testament. Uh, I mean, you know, we, we, we talk about, we've talked about cults that have extra biblical revelation and written down. I, I think sometimes people just don't necessarily have the extra biblical revelation written down, so you haven't mm -hmm. got another book, but you're missing out or just taking a few verses here and there because you can't read Romans, you can't read Galatians, you, you can't read these um, letters that Paul um, w w was so... Um, uh, bound you know, to, to talk, he, he, he just had to share it, of dealing with sin of, 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 and of showing that Christ had dealt with it. And if I allow Christ into my life, and even, you know, to a, a church like Corinthians, which, you know, he, he says is, you know, was absolutely half of them were, were so, so weak and wishy-washy that, you know, you wondered where they were coming from. Even there he deals with it, that Christ is our sin and, and he's been taken away and he's taken sin away and dealt with it. And th this message doesn't seem to be preached today. Absolutely. I mean, if you were to ask people, could you define the gospel? In many cases, they couldn't actually. And you've mentioned the church at Corinth. You have the most succinct definition yes. of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Yes. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is, and the sin 
question was all to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. In the the annunciation to Joseph in this case, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, the addiction that you have or the marriage breakdown that you have, those are important and those are the fruits of sin, but you have to get to the root first of all. And when someone is converted, the Lord will then move in and deal with the fruits of the mm. sin that was in your life. But you've got to get to the root problem first of all. Mm. And, and it seems that certainly within the, 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 some of the bigger churches and what are termed uh, seeker-friendly churches, um, that, that this message is not there. Now, one doesn't have a problem in having meetings where people can just chat and talk about that. that, that that's fine. And, and so, you know, sometimes people aren't just ready to go into a full-blown church meeting. So you have, fringe meetings isn't really the word, but you know what I mean, but you, you, you have them there. But unless at some point the, the whole gospel is preached to them. You know, the fact that, yes, they have been saved, but now they are being saved and they will be saved. Unless that whole gospel is preached to them, th- th- they're never going to make it, are they? Well, Paul lamented, woe unto me as if I preach not the gospel. Mm. Uh, you must preach the gospel. And then you must disciple people who have been truly converted. As you said, I have been saved. That's when we're fully justified before God. Right. The condemnation of our sin has gone. Our sins and iniquities he will remember no more. Uh, I, but then he's got to deal with yes. the life that he Maybe. has <laughs> redeemed. I, I used to tell people, it's a bit like when I worked in the building society, I would give people a mortgage to buy a building site to put a house up on. Yeah. So they bought the building site, they've got it, it's owned by the owner, but then he has to start cleaning it up yeah. in order to put up a nice house. Mm. And that's what God has done with us. He has purchased us by the blood of Christ, and now he's putting up a temple fit for the Holy Spirit to indwell. And some sins get away very easily. They're dealt with easily, but others are deep-rooted and you need, they take a lot of work. And, and, and the tragedy, of course, here is in many ways we are talking about our brothers and sisters, aren't we? We, we, we are talking about those who have, have some knowledge of the Lord. And, and what we're saying to them is not condemning them and say, oh, you're, you're, you're awful, you're terrible. But we're saying to them, there's more. They're, they're, you know, you, know the, you, you can change, you can be different, you can be different to this world. And, and, and that's what we're encouraging them to do. I, I suppose another phrase that's used in a slightly different way, but I guess it's the same sort of area, is, is you have this phrase, I, I don't know if it's very kind or not, but charismania. In, in, in other words, you, 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 you have the charisma, you, you have the gifts. And then you have the total extreme of, 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 of the gifts. Is this causing people problems today? Well, in, in my own experience, after I was converted, I had a, a brief flirtation, as I call it, for about three years or so with things Pentecostal and charismatic to a degree. Uh, I mean, I was a newborn babe in Christ and I didn't know about the different doctrines that differentiate Pentecostals from non-Pentecostals. Through time, uh, I came to a non-Pentecostal position, but I recognize that there are good brothers and sisters in the Lord who are Pentecostal. In fact, I was baptized as a believer in an Elam Pentecostal church, and I regarded the pastor, and I still regard him as a good brother in the Lord, Mm -hmm. and there are many people like that. However, uh, early in my ministry of Take Heed, I was there when a certain blessing appeared on the scene from a certain part of Canada. And this is what I would call the charismania, where all sorts of things were being attributed to the Holy Spirit, which were totally contrary to what the Scripture teaches us about the Holy Spirit. You had people going to this place in Canada, and they were ending up totally out of control. Mm -hmm. And yet one of the ingredients of the fruit of the Spirit is temperance, which means Mm self-control. So you should never be totally out of it uh, in in that sense and doing all sorts of weird and and wacky things, if you like. And unfortunately, there there seems to be 
it's sort of something comes along and then it dies down and it's quiet for a year or two something and then else. something else comes along and uh, we had nearly a, a, a revival of the Canadian type experience down in, in Lakeland and mm -hmm. Florida a, a couple of years ago and many people who had been involved in the Canadian experience suddenly reappeared on mm -hmm. the scene. Uh, I don't think those things bring any glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know many conservative Pentecostals who I willingly fellowship with would be aghast uh, at the, the charismania that has going on. But I think it's just one of the many challenges that Christians are faced with when you see these things being done in the name of the Lord mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. I, I, you, you know, for I, I, to me, it, it's the extreme. And, and I think one of the tragedies of the extreme is it puts people off from the norm. I, I mean, I personally still very much believe the gifts of the Spirit are for the day and should be exercised within the church under the leadership of, 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 of the, the church leadership decently and in order. Um, but when you get this extreme coming in and some of the things that are said and some of the things that, that are done and are recorded that they're on YouTube and, and, and all the rest of it that are un, so unchristlike, it puts people off completely. And I, I don't know what it is about people. What is it about Christians that want to take everything to extreme that aren't content with what God has said and God wants. You know, because to me, if you, if you talk about prophecy, prophecy is the most amazing uh, gift of prophecy. Tongues can be beautiful, you know, if, if they're not to totally taken out of context. But when you take it to extreme, it, it just becomes, well, I was going to say gibberish, and I'm sure I'll get many letters in <laughs> as a result of that. But it is, and, and, and it's just not, it's not deemed because it says it's for edifying. You've, you've said that it's not for edifying the body, is it? These things do not edify the body any longer when we go to that extreme. One of the fascinating things is when some of these charismania things break out, it's very often secular journalists and writers yes. who have a better appreci appreciation of how un Christian and on Christ like these things are than some who profess actually to be Christian. Uh, you very often find that uh, mm. in, in the press. Mm. It, and it is, it, it's going back to Christ and his ministry, isn't it? it? It's going back to seeing how he did. And then going back, for instance, of seeing Paul's teaching on. On, on, on the gifts. And I, what I find interesting about Corinthians, because you know, the book of Corinthians, where most of it is, had nothing to do, Paul wasn't sitting down writing a treatise of how to use the gifts. He was actually sitting down writing a treatise of how not to use the gifts. And I think we miss out on that sometimes. And I think we miss out on the key areas where he talks about love is so essential. And you, you can have all of these gifts, but if I don't love my neighbor and if I don't reach out to them, what, what point is I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a clanging symbol. Yeah, the, the confusion and chaos at uh, Corinth is not really a template yeah. to be followed. Absolutely, absolutely. Tragically, it is being followed in, in, in some areas. And, and I guess you, like us, we've met the people that have been harmed uh, by that, the people that have had personal prophecies spoken over them that really have done them damage rather than good. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in meetings where I've seen some of these people almost act like a medium, you know, the way that they put a, 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 a prophecy forward. And I tell you, my spirit just, I, I just react uh, to that because you're actually doing damage to a person. Whereas I know in my life, I, I've had times when a brother uh, in, in the, ha, ha, has personally prophesied over me and it's been absolute and you know God is speaking to you and there's such a difference between those those two areas yeah I, I, as I told you I had a brief flirtation for three or four years and then I ended up coming to a, a different conclusion yeah. from yourself but one of the things that that challenged me was what you said about it, it nearly ends up like a uh, a fortune teller, a sanctified yes. fortune teller. And, and, and that worried me in, in a particular instance, and I'll mention who the people were and so on. Uh, and that was what drove me to, to study the scriptures. And 
is to say uh, we are allowed liberty of conscience Amen. to end up to... I won't uh, kick you off my <laughs> programme because you don't agree with me. In, in fact, if I kicked everybody off that didn't agree with me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually uh, interview anybody in the end. But no, it's true. And, and yes, we are there. Many will agree, many will disagree. That, that it, it, this point in time is not the issue. It, it is the heart, isn't it, of, 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 of saying if we go to extreme, we are going to cause damage rather than good. We are not going to edify people. We, we, we're going to break them down. And we shouldn't be doing that to the body of Christ. Yeah, I mean, you can take it the other way. I mean, I, I would be one who would subscribe to the doctrines of grace. Mm. And then you get those who are rather hyper about that yes. viewpoint. Well, I don't agree with them at all. Yeah. Whilst I subscribe to the doctrines of grace, I recognize that God has ordained the means by which he, people are going to be saved. And that's why you and I Amen. will be out there sowing the seeds of Amen. the truth of the gospel. Amen. Um, before we finish, let, let, let's just move on to another area. In, in one sense, it's completely different. But there seems to be a tremendous move for ecumenicalism these days. And it's something I've looked at on, on, on this program before. But it, it's fraught with many dangers, isn't it? Because to really... <laughs> there's nothing wrong to desire unity. In fact, I'll correct myself there, everything should desire unity. But it's the basis of that unity, isn't it? What what is wrong with this phrase ecumenicalism? What what why why should we be so just aware of it? Well, I, I, let me say I'm all for biblical ecumenism. Ecumenism, in other words, where we may worship in different churches and so on, but we're agreed on the fundamentals, the truth is what matters. And the problem with false ecumenism is that it's a unity that is at the expense of truth. Uh, I think a great example was the 1994 Evangelicals and Catholics Together document that was signed, The Christian Mission for the Third Millennium, where evangelicals sought to fuse together with Roman Catholicism and say, well, really, we're all Christians together. But what they had to do in that document is they had to actually say that there are actually two ways two options of how you become a Christian. Mm. One is that you can become a Christian the evangelical way when God moves in by the power of his spirit, convicts you of your sin and converts you to faith in Christ. Uh, that is the evangelical understanding. And then they conceded that actually you can also become a Christian through being baptized mm. in water. Well, unfortunately, those two things just don't mix together. Mm. And uh, I believe that the scriptures reject the notion that you can become uh, a Christian through mere uh, religious ritual. Mm. Uh, and, and of course, we've, we've had two programs that, that, that have dealt with that where we've had opportunity to hear in, in, in that sense for, from the Roman Catholic side. And, and actually also we did a program on, on ecumenism as, as to where, where that come from. And so we've listened to the other side and, and I'm sure we'll be doing programs in the future mm -hmm. that will listen to the other side. So again, we're not just saying these things here, everybody has a right of reply. But what we are saying is where it takes us away from the central doctrines of Christianity, mm -hmm. we do have major issues over that. And, and you can't compromise because either you're saved by grace alone through faith alone or some act, whether it's baptism or whatever else it is, some act saves you. And all you've got to do is go through that outward act. But as you say, both those things can't be true. And therefore that document in actual fact is, 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 is misleading yes. and it's giving people uh, an option to choose that God has never given us. Yeah, I mean, I had the privilege of speaking at an ex-Catholics for Christ conference in Los Angeles back about 1999, which was some years after that ECT document. And many Roman, former Roman Catholics who were there who had been converted to Christ and come away from Rome were saying how saddened they were by that document. Because if that was true, then why on earth did they ever have to leave what they had been raised up in? Mm -hmm. And Paul, for me, hits the nail on the head in the letter to the Galatians. 
if you try to mix in some religious ritual along with faith alone in Christ alone, you end up with another gospel. Mm. And sadly, that is what Roman Catholicism does yes. because the Catechism in 1129 basically says the sacraments, the religious ritual, are necessary for salvation. Whereas that's not, that's mm. rejected. Uh, in Galatians and in Titus 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Uh, so yeah. uh, you cannot blend. Going back to Corinthians, love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Mm. And we must always stick to the truth. We work together with those who share the truth, but we don't work together at the expense of the truth. Mm. And just to uh, remind you, as we're talking about different groups here, um, everyone has a, an opportunity and many of the groups that we have talked about have had representatives on the programme in the past. All of those programmes are available on YouTube and I will be delighted to hold further programmes uh, in the future that contrast the teachings of whether groups that we've called the cults, group that we've called it, ecumenism, whatever it is, I will be delighted to hold further programs in the future. So please, um, you have every right of reply, so make sure you contact with us and, and, and I'll be glad to, uh, uh, to uh, follow that up with you. Uh, we're, we're, we're nearing the end uh, here, Cecil. Um, uh, what, what we've said, I think one of the things with ecumenism which I think has concerned me of late, is we've moved beyond just what you could call Christian churches in, in its broadest sense. We've actually moved in now into occultic groups and groups that would not in any way talk about one God, because most of the groups in ecumenism to one degree or another would talk about one God, even though there may be different ways to that God. But these groups, well, they, they will be into gods and goddesses. And, and it seems to me that the boundaries have been pushed even further. And that really does concern me. Yeah, there, there's a mushrooming syncretism, I suppose you might call it, where, and I hope you don't mind me coming back to Roman Catholicism, but they have often taken the lead in this. I mean, there have been over recent decades uh, assemblies of representatives of many religions at Assisi, where they have come together. Now, uh, it has been phrased, they have come together to pray. They have not come to pray together. That, that is a very fine line of demarcation. <laughs> but uh, the onlooking world simply see this as well. All religions are equal and valid, and here they are coming together. Uh, and as you say, they represent many, many different strands not just uh, monotheistic uh, religions, uh, but pantheistic and polytheistic and whatever it happens to be. And this, again, is very confusing. It is departing from the truth of the Word of God. And true Christians should have no part in that. Mm -hmm. And we should say, not just Catholics have been involved with that, because I can remember some meetings uh, in Canterbury Cathedral that did exactly uh, the, the same thing. And see, and the thing that you mentioned there it, it is confusing because if you've got a young believer, somebody that's been in the world that maybe looked at some of those religions in, in, in the past and then finally says, I want to be saved, I want to become a Christian, doesn't just pray the prayer but has a real transformation with God and then the next week sees this going on, they're totally confused because, as you say, we, you know, together to pray or pray together is, is, is just really semantics uh, because you're in the same room all praying to different gods. That's what it is in the end. Um, we need to have a clear message here. Again, not that let's hate these people, but what we believe is different to what they believe, what they believe, what they believe. We're, we're, we're talk with them, we we'll reach out to them, but we've got to come to that place. The spirit of the age is one of tolerance and let's all blend in together. But the scripture tells us not to be conformed to this world. We are to be different with distinctives. You mentioned the UK. I think it was the Commonwealth Day service that was held every year when Her Majesty the Queen would attend. And you had readings from all sorts of religious books and contributions by all sorts of non-Christian groups. put on the same level. When that, that's the issue, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Whereas 
Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think, Cecil, that it's sometimes not what we say, but how we say it? You've got about 30 seconds to answer that question. In other words, that we share to people, we share specifically, but we share nicely, kindly. Yeah, I, I was quite a hothead on the hockey field. And when I first went into apologetics, I, can't believe that. I think I was quite a hothead. I was like John Wayne in the Seventh Calvary, uh, Cavalry. Uh, I hope that over the years, the Lord is working the rough edges off. When David fought Goliath, it was smooth stones that were mm. taken from the stream to slay the, the evil giant. Mm. And if we're going to slay the giant of falsehood, we have to have the rough yes. edge of smooth I, I think I think listening to you in the two debates, I can say you've been smoothed off. You're fine. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Cecil, for being here. Thank you for joining us. Do take hold of what's been said. Study it for yourself. Reach out and minister to these people. See you again soon. Bye for now.